30 years was a fairly long time ago. Some of you don't remember that long ago. Is uh, You haven't been on this earth that long. Uh, for some of us, we were a little bit younger and, and we can remember 30 years ago, a little bit older that is, and we can remember uh, 30 years ago uh, with a little bit of uh, vagueness. And uh, for some of you, are a little bit older and maybe you have a little more clarity. 30 years ago, some of you can remember uh, Richard Nixon being president. You can remember the minimum wage being $1.60 per hour. You can remember 30 years ago when you could mail a letter with an eight-cent stamp. And you can remember 30 years ago in 1973 that our Supreme Court passed a decision we now call Roe v. Wade, as well as a sister companion decision called Doe v. Bolton, Both of those passed in 1973, and since that time, with the approval of the United States... Now, it may be that some of you who really are good with numbers say, wait, Greg, you mentioned last week that that number was closer to 41,229,000. That's correct. Because as I was gathering research last Saturday, that is eight days ago, the number was 441,229,000. But that was a week ago. And just in that week of time to that first number has been added another 23,500 children this week murdered in their mother's womb. Now, how do you make sense of 41,252,500? How how do you make sense of a number like that? That that number is so large, I'm I'm not sure I can grasp it. Let's just try to get a handle on what 41,252,500 people would look like. Let's, Let's start, for example, with the city of Greenville. In fact, let's expand it to the entire county of Greenville. All of the people that you see going to school every morning, going to work every morning, that maybe crowd the shopping stores that you go to, some of the sporting events that you attend, all of the people that you see in Greenville County, and why don't we just increase that to include the whole upstate so that we can include Anderson, Clemson, what have you, And then let's even not just limit it to the Piedmont, the upstate, but let's include Columbia. Some of you have traveled some in Columbia. You've been down there on business. Maybe you've been there to the zoo. You've been there to the State Museum and the uh, various political things. You take all of the people who live in Columbia in the whole midsection of our state, and then let's take the entire low country, the entire coast of South Carolina, And many of you have been stuck in traffic as maybe you would vacation at the beach or go down and see some of the historical sites in Charleston. Let's take all of the population of South Carolina and according to U.S. Census figures, you still only have approximately 4 million people. In our state, 4 million people. How many children aborted? Over 41 million So let's head north and let's include the state of North Carolina. Many of you have flown in and out of Charlotte. You've been up to Charlotte on business, but let's not even limit it to Charlotte. Let's take the entire state of North Carolina, which has a population of 8.3 million. Let's go south and include the whole Atlanta area. Many of you have flown in and out of Atlanta, been down to Atlanta for sporting events and what have you. And you know what it's like to be stuck in traffic in Atlanta. I remember trying to get through Atlanta on one of our mission trips when the Olympics were going on. It was kind of a tight place to be. In Georgia, what do we have? Approximately 8.5 million people. You put South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia together. You know what you have? You have 21 million people. That's still not even close to the number of children that have been aborted legally with the approval of our government in the United States since 1973. So let's go from North Carolina, let's spread out a little bit, and let's go all the way up to Virginia. And in Virginia, we have 6 million people. Then let's go west out to Tennessee, and that's another 5.8 million people. Let's go south of Tennessee, and let's pick 
Up uh, Alabama, down in that area, near Georgia, 4.5 million people. And you put South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, Tennessee, Alabama, all together. And I'm going to have to add to that Mississippi and West Virginia to get to the total number of children that have been legally murdered with the approval of our government since 1973 and the legalization of abortion. Guys, think about that. How long would it take you to drive through North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, West Virginia, and see all of the people that are there today? That is the number of babies that have been legally murdered in our country with the full blessing of the United States government. And that's terrible. That's absolutely terrible. And yet that's the number. If there's any good, there tends to be a reversal in public opinion since 1973. Especially among younger people. I have read repeatedly among all different types of groups in the research I've been doing these past two weeks that there is a growing disillusionment with the pro-choice movement. And many people are beginning to question if it really was in the best interest of women and the best interest of our country. In fact, I've read this week of many feminist groups that have begun to oppose abortion. As some research suggests that the pro-choice movement really has not resulted in choice for women, but coercion. As many men, be they boyfriends or husbands, insist that their partners have abortion because they simply don't want to be inconvenienced by another child. As many people have studied and realized that the abortion industry is actually more concerned with commerce than it is with compassion. Carol Everett operated several Dallas area abortion centers in the late 70s and early 80s before switching over to the pro-life side. And according to Carol Everett, she says that the governing force behind the abortion movement is not women's rights. It's money. She tells of how she personally made a commission of $25 every time she sold a woman on having an abortion, which in 1983 gave an approximate income of $250,000 in sales commission just on selling abortions. Planned Parenthood recently was discovered that in Ohio they were paying girls, students, $100 a piece to be so-called outreach workers, to go out and find their pregnant girlfriends to encourage them to come to Planned Parenthood abortion clinics, and then they gave them a bonus of $5 for each girl that they would recruit. You say, why? Because of the money. And as more and more people begin to look into this topic, more and more people begin to question, is this really good? Women's health. Back in the 70s, people said, you know, let's not go back to back alley abortions. Why would you want to outlaw that which is protecting the lives of so many women? When abortions were illegal, we had tens of thousands of women that were killed each year in these illegal practices. And yet to quote Dr. Bernard Nathanson, one of the founders of the National Abortion Rights Action League who has since changed sides and now joined, joined the pro-life side. Those statistics are completely false. Research has been done on how many women actually died in so-called back alley abortions. In 1972, the year before our country legalized abortion, the number of women who died in illegal abortions was not even close to 10,000. In fact, it was not even close to 5,000. In fact, it was less than 1,000. No, it was less than 500. No, much less. It was less than 100. No, why don't I just give you the figure? 39. The number of women killed in 1972 in back alley abortions that's documented 
39. You've seen the posters with the coat hangers that says never again. And their statistics are lies as they seek to justify what they seek to, to push forward for financial and other reasons. Of course, ignoring the negative health implications of abortion. And many of you remember reading in recent years of links, anywhere from 30 to 50% increase in breast cancer in women that have had abortion. Not to mention the so-called mental struggles that women go through. There's actually a name for it. I'm not sure I would use this name, but it's called post-abortion syndrome. Women that have had abortions and are just so troubled by the fact that they're responsible for murdering their own child that they simply have trouble struggling. All of these reasons are causing people to question whether abortion was good for women and good for our nation. But my question tonight is different. As Christians, as Christians, why do we oppose abortion? I'd like to suggest two reasons why. The second, much more important than the first, even though I think the first is worthy of mention, because it's not only something that we relate to, it's something that the Bible speaks of. Why is it that we oppose abortion? The first reason, and the lesser of the two, but the first reason, is that abortion is morally repulsive. Abortion is morally repulsive. You say, Greg, what do you mean by morally repulsive? Here's what I'm saying. Most of us are naturally repulsed by the killing of children. When we read of children being murdered, somehow that hits us deep inside. Not that murdering adults is somehow not wrong. But when you pick up the, ch- the newspaper and read that children have been murdered, that just does something in your conscience, right? I think of biblical accounts. We won't turn, but let me remind you of Exodus chapter 1. The Pharaoh of Egypt concerned that the children of Israel were going to multiply. And as they continued to multiply, that all of a sudden he may be in a struggle with them. And so the Pharaoh of Egypt, ordering the Hebrew midwives in Exodus chapter 1 to put to death all of the male infants. And listen, guys, you don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to be a Jew. You read that account in Exodus 1 and you say, that's wrong. To put a child to death because it's a male, that's wrong. There's something morally repulsive about that. Of course, a New Testament example would have to do with the birth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For we know that Herod ordered the death of all male children in the city of Bethlehem that were two years and younger. Why? Because he was hoping to kill the Lord Jesus Christ, who he considered somebody who would, who would maybe go for his earthly throne, not realizing that our Savior came for a heavenly kingdom and not an earthly kingdom. But still, Christian, Jew, or not, you read the account in Matthew chapter 2, and you find out that Herod ordered the death of all children under two in the city of Bethlehem. And there's something deep inside of us that says that's wrong. People, that's not an accident. That's conscience. God has given us a conscience. Before I was saved, I was opposed to abortion. Now, part of that, no doubt, was that I was raised in a Roman Catholic background. But even in that tradition, where the vast majority of the people do not know Christ, and certainly the gospel is not publicly proclaimed, people have enough of a conscience to say it's wrong. I'll never forget talking to one of my daughters that I won't name. And she said something like, Daddy, are you going out? I said, yeah, hon, I'm going to go vote for president. Daddy, who are you going to vote for? And I said, I'm going to vote for candidate A. We'll just call him candidate A. And, and, and she said, Daddy, why are you voting for candidate A? And I said, well, because I won't vote for candidate B. And she said, well, do you think candidate A is a Christian, Daddy? I said, I hope so, baby. I don't know. I hope so. But there's one thing I know. Candidate A says it's a sin for a mommy to kill her baby when it's in her tummy. 
Candidate B says it's okay for a mommy to kill her baby when it's in her tummy. And I looked, and there were tears in her eyes. And she began to weep. Because the thought that a mother would kill her own child in her own tummy, as I would explain it to my young daughter, was so morally repulsive that she wept that someone could do such a wicked thing as killing her own child. Guys, why did the case of Susan Smith shock our country? To have a young woman in her 20s write in 1994 get out of her Mazda protege to take that car and park it in Union, South Carolina at the top of a boat ramp to have her two children in the back seat, three-year-old Michael and 14-month-old Alex, to step out of the car after putting the handbrake on, to release the handbrake, to gently close the door so no one would be awakened, to let the car go down the boat ramp when it went into the lake and did not, but it bobbed in the water as it slowly filled with water. And slowly, her two boys drowned. And whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, people all over the United States cried out, that's wrong. That's wrong. I don't care what happened to her when she was a kid. I don't care how tough her life has been. That is morally repulsive. For a mother to do that is inexcusable. It's wrong. I wish I could say that's the only case that comes to mind. June 20, 2001, Andrea Yates takes three of her own children, five-year-old John, three-year-old Paul, two-year-old Luke, and drowns them in her own bathtub. By her own testimony, was in the middle of drowning her fourth child, six-month daughter Mary, when seven-year-old Noah walked into the room. And seven-year-old Noah said, Mom, what's wrong with Mary? She stopped drowning Mary. She chased Noah through the house. She grabbed Noah, fighting her. She dragged him back to the bathroom and drowned him. All five children by a mother drowned. And again, you may be here tonight and not even know what it means to be a Christian, but there's something inside of you that screams out, That is wrong. It is morally repulsive. Murder is bad. The murder of children is worse. And when it's done by a mother, it's even worse. The person we look to to nurture life, the person who for most of us stayed home and cared for us, it's wrong. You say, Greg, any indication of this in Scripture? Yes, there is. There's a word in Scripture an interesting word. A word that I, I like the King James translation of it. It's called without natural affection. It's a word that talks about the love that every mother should have for a daughter, should have for a son. And yet it's negated. And rather than being the word of family or natural affection... It has what is called an alpha privative, a knot in front of it. And thus it's translated in the King James Bible without natural affection. In other translations, many just say unloving. I invite your attention to Romans chapter 1, where we'll look at the first of these two occurrences. Romans chapter 1. This type of behavior that is so morally repulsive is not new, unfortunately. Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, this word without natural affection occurs in verse 31. But I'd like to set up just a little bit of context and begin with verse 18. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress who hold, that is, hold down the truth in unrighteousness. These are people who hold down God's truth. 
It says in verse 20, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, having been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, makes them without excuse. It says in verse 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was dark in verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Right? The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And verse 23, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. These are the fools. How many times I, I've been at a stoplight and I've seen that little metal emblem on the back of somebody's car, SUV or truck, of, 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 a, of a large fish with a tail with little feet on it. And in the middle it says, Darwin. As they mock God. As they mock the creation account. Another one of, of some type of animal, if it were, uh, again, in a similar way, swallowing a fish. Now there's Christian counterparts to these. Again, as they mock the Christian message. What does the Bible say? Verse 24. God gave them over in the lust of their hearts. Let them go. Own sin of your lustful heart. I won't hold you back anymore. That's verse 24. God gave them over to the lust of their heart. Look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over, the same thing, to degrading passions. And there it talks about homosexuality. No, God didn't condemn them to homosexuality. God didn't send them into homosexuality. God simply said, if that's the kind of life you want to live, I will no longer hold you back. You are free to pursue sin. And this third parallel, if you will, verse 28, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over, there it is again, to a depraved or reprobate mind to do those things which are not proper. And you say, Greg, what are these people like? Well, beginning in verse 29 and through verse 31, there's a list of 29 specific sins. Excuse me, 21. 21 specific sins. And if you read through this so-called vice list of verses 29, 30, and 31, you'll eventually come to verse 31, where it says that these people are, first of all, without understanding, secondly, untrustworthy, and thirdly, unloving. Again, in the King James, without natural affection. A word that was used of the Roman practice of exposure. Now, most of us aren't familiar with the word exposure in this context. We think of exposure as being many different things. In the ancient world, exposure was a very definite response to an unwanted child, which typically would be female. What took place in the Roman world, if you had a wife who gave birth, or even a woman, you're giving birth and you have a girl, or for some reason don't want your son. You would simply walk outside to a given hill, take your child, lay it on the side of the hill, and you would go home. And the idea was, if the gods gave me this child, let the gods take care of it. I'm not going to. And it said that there were certain hills in ancient Rome where you couldn't even walk because of the stench of decaying flesh from all of these children left to die was absolutely morally repulsive. It was an affront to your sense of smell. That's what the word without natural affection means. That's what the word unloving means. Some other translations. Inhumane. Or how about this one? Heartless. Heartless. How could a mother or even a father but especially a mother, take her own daughter and leave her on the side of a hill and walk away to let her suffer and die. That's heartless. Another translation, unfeeling. How could anyone with any feeling do such a thing? And yet in our country, it happens every day. Every day. I would argue abortion is no less murder 
than these children left to die on the side of hills, with maybe one exception. Because in God's good grace and God's good providence, I personally have never read of this happening, but I can't help but wonder if at least maybe sometimes someone, a shepherd, a, a passing traveler, would not come by and find one of those children on the side of the hill and claim it and take it home and save its life. With abortion, that's not an option because the child is dead before the mother leaves the clinic. That's one example of that word without natural affection. We see it here in Romans chapter 1. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and see the second example. Without natural affection. A completely different context, but the same word. 2 Timothy 3.3 3. I'll begin with verse 1 for just a little bit of context. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. In verse 1, the author states, Paul states, but realize that in the last days, difficult or perilous times will come. Before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, things are going to be real bad. Teachers, we get to verse 3 and look at the first characteristic in verse 3. will be what? Without natural affection. Or if you will, unloving. A sign of the last days, that same word, that has to do with not even having enough humaneness that you would seek to care for your own child. Why is abortion wrong? Well, I think, number one, because it's morally repulsive. And that's not a mistake. God has given us a conscience. The average person knows that abortion is morally wrong. I'm convinced of it. They may fight against it. They may suppress the truth. But deep inside, there's a problem. They know it's wrong. But I'd like to transition and say, okay, is there a bigger reason, if you will, a greater reason why abortion is wrong? For those of us who have been born again, we've come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we've, we've, we've accepted His gift of eternal life, and we've accepted His Word as binding in our lives. And the best we know, we submit to it. Is there a greater reason that abortion is wrong? And the answer is yes. Abortion is wrong not only because it's morally repulsive, but it's wrong because it is a personal insult to our God. It is a personal insult to our God. Invite your attention to Genesis chapter 1. Let's go way back to the creation account. Way back in Genesis chapter 1. And be reminded of the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1. And we'll begin with verse 26 in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in... Our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God, verse 27, created man in his own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. Man is made in the image of God. All of us, I think, realize we're different than animals. We definitely know we're different than plants. But if somebody asked you, in what way are we different than animals? Or what way, in what way are we different than plants? The, the Bible tells us we are made in God's image. Animals are not made in God's image. Plants are not made in God's image. People are made in God's image. Look again at the text, verse 26. Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Image and likeness referring to the same thing. It's what's called Hebrew parallelism. Frequently you'll say the same thing with two different words, intensifying the idea that man and only man is made in the image of God. Turn over to Genesis chapter 5, please. For a repetition of this truth and, and maybe a little illustration that will 
help us to understand this a little better. Genesis 5. Genesis 5, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, He made him in the likeness, there it is, of God. He created them male and female. He blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. Verse 3 states, when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son. Now watch this. In his own likeness, according to his image. And he named him Seth. Seth was made in the image and likeness of Adam. Maybe at least giving us a rough idea of what it means when man was made in the image of God. There is something in man that reflects the person of God. In the same way that Seth reflected the person of Adam. Privilege. A church planner to Canada presented his ministry. And it was interesting, after we uh, heard his presentation, my wife and I went home and uh, were talking about what a blessing it was. And both of us thought the same thing. We said, you know what? I was watching John Banks Sr. share his burden for Canada, and I kept thinking about John Jr. See, that was the first time I met John Banks Sr. Now, his son John Jr. has fellowshiped with us for a while before he and his wife Abby moved up to Canada to help mom and dad. I had never met dad. But I knew John Jr. And if you were going to describe John Jr., I guess in one word, it would be nice. Just a nice guy. I mean really nice. I mean nice. You know, there's nice and there's nice. Okay? I don't think most of us are mean. But most of us aren't really, 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 really nice. John was one of those guys that just kind of hit me as really, 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 really nice. And then his dad preached Wednesday. And to be honest with you, not what I would call an incredibly powerful preacher. Not one who just grabbed you with his skills, but one who made you sit back and go, he really is nice. And here's what my wife said to me. I'll bet you his people love him. He has such a burden for people. And he is such a nice person. It, now I know where his son got it. A chip off the old block. Seth, in Genesis 5, was a chip off the old block. To look at Seth was to remind you of Adam. And with no irreverence, people, in a sense, a chip off the Heavenly Father. To look at people in some way reminds us of what God is like. Greg, you say what people? All people? Absolutely, all people. The Bible is very clear that all people are made in the image of God. It's not just one race. It's not just one gender. It doesn't just happen when you get saved. This is just one point where Lutheran theology is wrong. Martin Luther taught that man lost the image of God in the fall only to be remade in the image of salvation. That is wrong. Unregenerate man continues to be made in the image of God. You say, how do you know that? We can go to a couple places, but just one is James chapter 3. James chapter 3. I just want to be very clear on this. Even if a person does not know Christ, He still is made. He still bears, if I can use that word, the image of God. And that is very clear in James. Chapter 3. A text that is talking about the wickedness of the tongue. How unfortunately all of us have had the experience of saying things that did not honor God and that tore people apart. In James chapter 3, we'll look at verse 8. But no one can tame the tongue... It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Now watch verse 9. With it, our tongues, we bless our Lord and Father. The idea is that's good. And with it, we curse men. That's bad. Now what's true of men? Who have been made in the likeness of God? 
The men we curse, would that be a reference to regenerate men, to unregenerate men, to males, to females? It's generic. Men who have been made in the likeness of God. The similitude, if you will, of God. And the tense in the underlying Greek text is what we call a perfect tense, which has the idea of something that took place in the past but continues to be relevant to the present moment. Men who in the past and continuing up into this moment have been made in the similitude or likeness of God. Even unregenerate man continues to bear the image of God. Now, some of you are thinking, but wait a second. Didn't the fall change that? Yes. But it did not eradicate it. It did not eradicate it. Think of it as a mirror. Saved man. Man without sin, if you will. Originally, let's put it, Adam and Eve. Looking in a mirror, if I can use this illustration, there is a clear picture. Because of sin, the mirror becomes dirty. The image of... Now, stay with me, if you will. Because I want to just bring up one point of theology. Systematic theology. And that's the question, then, what does it mean to be made in God's image? Basically, two views. Two views. One is what we call the functional view. One is what we call the substantive view. And I'd like to just take a second to explain what those words mean. The functional view means being made in God's image is something I do. Hey, are you made in God's image? All people are. What does that mean? It means we do something. Because we're made in God's image, we have a certain function to perform. What is that function? Most people relate it to what's called the cultural mandate, fill the earth and subdue it, Genesis 1.28. You say, do you believe that's correct? No, I don't. Because the image of God is not something we do. The image of God is something we are. God did not say to man, I want you to fill the earth and subdue it so that you can be made in the image of God. God said to man, because you're made in the image of God, I want you to fill the earth and subdue it. So the image of God is not a function. It's something that's part of you. It's substantive. It's part of your very being. You say, what? The very part of you that's different from animals. Do animals have mind, will, and emotion in a human sense? And the answer is no. Put that together. What do we call it? Personality. Now, I know some of you are going to say, well, Greg, my pet has personality. And I understand what you mean. But certain tendencies, maybe. But your pet is not home tonight thinking, when is my master coming home? I wonder if he's going to come home and put on this TV show. I wonder if he's going to let me out. If he doesn't, I'll be sad. You're, 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 you know what I'm saying. Now, we, we realize that certain dogs are, are very finicky, if you will, and uptight. Others are kind of laid back and mellow. And sometimes we talk about a dog's personality. And I'm not saying that's wrong. Okay? We, we have a discussion going on in our house right now. I've been asked today alone, I think, at least 50 times, Daddy, can we have a dog? Okay? So my daughters are smiling. Uh, but they already know that the answer is no. Okay? <laughs> Even though I love dogs. Even though I love dogs. It's just not, not a good thing for us. What makes you different than a dog? It's that you're made in the image of God. You have personality. You're not an animal. You say, is that all that it means to be made in the image of God? No, there's a second thing. It's not just personality, mind, will, emotion, self-consciousness. It's secondly, positive righteousness. When God created Adam and Eve, did He make them wicked, neutral, or positively righteous? And biblically, the answer is, guess what? Positively righteous. After God created man, He declared that it's not only good, it's very good. Again, Catholic theology is wrong here, where it says that man was born with a tendency towards sin, something called concupiscence. That's terrible. Because if you say man is not as wicked, then the work of Jesus Christ is not as wonderful. And anything that would take away from how wicked it is to fall from original righteousness into sin, which is what Adam and Eve did, would take away from the work of Christ. The reason the fall is so terrible, let me just try to be clear about what I said maybe wasn't as clear as I meant it. 
to fall from positive righteousness into sin is a terrible thing. A terrible thing. We didn't fall from a tendency to sin into sin. We fell from positive righteousness into sin. Whether you follow that or not, the point I want to make is simply this. The image of God is something that is within every human being, saved or unsaved, marred but still present, even in unregenerate people. Now, here's my question. Why then is abortion an insult to God? And the answer is in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. This is the main point I wanted to communicate this evening. This is chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Let me read that again. Whoever sheds man's blood, that's murder, by man his blood shall be shed. Meaning, murder is such a terrible sin that capital punishment is appropriate. Why? The second part of verse 6 in Genesis 9. For in the image of God, He made man. People, the reason that murder in general, and I'll say abortion included in that, obviously in the context of tonight's message, is such a wicked sin is not merely because a young boy or a young girl will never have a chance to live. It's not merely because a mother has done that which is morally repulsive. It's because we have personally insulted God. Because to take human life unjustly is to insult the one who made life in His image. Let's see if I can give an illustration or two that might help. I think most of us have seen pictures. Maybe you've never really been at an anti-war demonstration. I don't believe I've ever been at one, but I've seen pictures in this country, in other countries, but in this country, I guess it hurts the most, of Americans at some type of so-called peace rally as they would take an American flag. You might be say for saying that's freedom of expression and that should be allowed and you might be one to say that we should have a constitutional amendment. I, I, I don't understand what the, the, the right decision would be in such a case. But I know one thing. They're, they're doing more than just burning a piece of cloth. When they burn that flag, they're making a statement. They're attacking our nation. And I don't know about you. Maybe this is not true of you. I'm sure for some it is. I see that And I get sad. In fact, when I think about it, I get more than sad. I get angry. As I think to myself, the only reason you have the freedom to do that is because of this wonderful nation in which you live. You do that in some other countries, you'd be shot on the spot. How could you attack our country that way? You say, Greg, lighten up. They're not attacking our country. They're just burning cloth. It's just cloth. No, it's more than cloth. It's cloth that represents something higher. It's in the image of our nation. Or maybe you've seen pictures in some of the news magazines after the fall of communism in the former Soviet Union. And you would see these groups of people going to these parks, to these these meeting areas in, in the former Soviet Union, taking these statues of Stalin. And as they would push them down, huge statues, they would hit the ground and break. And people with smiles on their faces and sledgehammers in their hand, just whacking away at statues of Stalin. And I would look at that, and I would smile, and I would think, Amen. For how long have Christians prayed for the fall of communism? That the gospel could go forth, that Christian believers would find freedom. That, that, that brothers like our, our brother who's now with Christ in glory, George E. Vins, wouldn't have to be put in concentration camps just because he was a believer. 
And you saw that and you said, oh, relax, Greg, it's no big deal, it's just a statue. But you know, that statue bore the image of a man who stood for communism. It wasn't just a statue. It was more than that. And the emotion that follows is what? For most of us, I think it was joy. Maybe if I could use one more illustration that's a little more personal that would try to explain what God feels when an abortion takes place. What would happen if I came up to you and said, do you have a picture of your mother, uh, your favorite, your, your favorite picture of your mother? Could I have that? And you said, well, if you want, it, it's kind of special. I mean, it's made in the image of my mother. It bears my mother's image. But if you'd like it, I guess you could have it. And I took that picture. And I took a pair of scissors and I cut it up into little pieces. This valued picture that was made in the image of your mother. And then I took those pieces and I threw them to the ground. And with my foot, with my shoe, I stepped on them. And I pushed them into the dirt as hard as I could. And then before walking away, I spit on them. And I said, there, there's the picture of your mother. And you would do what? Would you smile and say, just a picture, buddy. Just a picture. It doesn't matter. I don't think so. If you were raised like I was raised, there were few exceptions when fighting was appropriate. And when somebody dishonored your mother, that was one of them. If I was ever in a fight, which normally was for very less than noble reasons, but if I ever was in a fight and I would say, Dad, here's what somebody said about Mom, I'm fine. I'm fine. Because I was taught you don't dishonor your mother nor tolerate others who do people. I'm not talking about an earthly mother. I'm talking about a heavenly father. What does God think when day after day in our country people take life created in His image and they destroy it? And they destroy it. I would suggest to you that He's insulted. And the number one reason why abortion is wrong is not because it's morally repulsive, even though it is. It's because it's an insult to the very one who sent his only son to die on the cross for our sin. That's why abortion is wrong. You say, okay, how do we respond? Well, in closing this evening, I'd like to just share four conclusions, if you will that have to do with abortion, realizing how terrible it is and we should all consider as we respond. And we'll go through these quickly. Number one, the ultimate goal of glorifying God, which means we should openly proclaim that abortion is wrong. Right? We won't turn there, but Colossians 1.16, all things were created by Him and for Him. That includes you. That includes me. Why were we created? To magnify God. How is God magnified when we proclaim what is true? When we proclaim what He has said? We should never be ashamed to speak out and say abortion is wrong. And not ashamed to give the number one reason why. Increased opportunity for breast cancer? Okay, yes. All the surgical complications that could take place? Yeah, that's fine. All of the commerce issues are being used for financial gain? Okay, that's fine. But let's make sure we give people the number one reason why it's wrong. Because it's an insult to God. And not to be ashamed of that. That abortion is wrong because the one who died on the cross for my sin and your sin is insulted whenever human life is unjustly taken. Number one, the ultimate goal of life is glorifying God. We should openly proclaim that abortion is wrong. Don't be ashamed. You may work in a situation where there's very liberal people around you. Don't be ashamed. Speak out for God and honor His name. Number two, people's thinking will only change when they've had a change of heart. We can argue with statistics all we want, but you know when real change comes? Real change came, comes not up here in the mind. Real change comes when God reaches down and regenerates the heart. 
The Bible says, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man, for out of the heart come evil thoughts and murders. Matthew fifteen eighteen. Where does murder come from? It comes from a heart that is set on murdering. Where do evil thoughts come from? They come out of a heart that's set on murdering. I can convince an unregenerate man that abortion is wrong. That's maybe not a terrible thing, but that's not real change. True change will take place when people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And thus, if we want to see people have a change of mind, what we really need to do is to have them come to Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because once the heart changes, the mind will change. Until the heart changes, it's hard to have a change of mind. I will use a parallel issue for an example. I put on public radio this week and I heard the name Jerry Thacker. I thought, public radio, Jerry Thacker? I'm not on a Christian station. I mean, what's his name on the radio for? And I don't even know the details because I only caught the second half of the story, but he was, I assume, appointed or maybe at least being considered to be appointed to some type of White House position related to homosexuality. Jerry Thacker, as you know, a born-again believer, a one who gives forth the gospel but with great courage, has AIDS that he got through some type of blood transfusion. And he now speaks out on that issue, on that topic, and yet shares the gospel. And somebody, I guess, different people perhaps, found out that this man was going to be appointed, I assume, by our White House to be on some type of commission or committee. Again, I probably should have checked my facts more, but some type of organization. And they found out that he was a born-again believer. They found out that he spoke openly against homosexuality. And immediately, from our White House, decision reversed. Too much political pressure here. Too hot of a topic for us to deal with. Thacker can't be in this organization. He's the kind of guy who thinks homosexuality is a sin. And that's how unregenerate people think. I use that as an example that you can't change thinking just with statistics and just with data. Thinking follows a change of heart. The great need is regeneration. And you might think, Greg, do you think it's possible? Some of you know this, but it is so thrilling for me to read, and so I share it with you. The story of Rome. The story of Rome. Why is the court decision called Roe v. Wade? Because the pseudonym given to Norma McCorvey was Jane Roe. She didn't want anyone to know who she was. Norma McCorvey, once an abortion rights supporter, has now changed sides and has become an outspoken anti-abortion pro-life activist. You say, how? Well, she began her association with one of the United States' most contentious and volatile socio-political issues in 1970 when she was the lead plaintiff in the class action lawsuit filed to challenge the strict anti-abortion laws in Texas. She was 21, and the case was filed on her third pregnancy. By the way, she never had the abortion. She gave the child up for adoption. But Corby, a ninth grade dropout who says she suffered physical abuse as a child, was in reform school in Gainesville, Texas, raped as a teenager, married at 16 to a husband who beat her, had a life of alcohol abuse and drug abuse, experiences with so-called lovers of both sexes, Drifted through a series of jobs, including bartender, carnival barker, went public with her story and became a celebrity in pro-abortion circles. Was hired to speak out on behalf of pro-abortionists. She was the one who helped to begin Roe v. Wade. And so in 1995, she was working at an abortion clinic in Dallas. And next door, a pro-life group, Operation Rescue, moved its offices next door. And a preacher of the gospel who was in charge of that pro-life clinic would stand outside when McCorvey would go out for a cigarette break. And interestingly enough, they struck up a friendship. And this preacher of the gospel began to share Christianity with McCorvey. And people began to pray for the salvation of McCorvey. 
She became friendly with the staff at Operation Rescue, and I'm not saying I agree with all their tactics. She accepted an invitation from the daughter of the group's office manager to come to church. She accepted, and that night, she accepted Christ as her Savior, and she was born again. The woman who championed the cause of abortion says, quote, I've now committed my life to serving the Lord and helping women save babies. Isn't that a wonderful story of the grace of God to take a woman who's been through that type of challenging life, a woman who's the key person in the Roe v. Wade case, and I realize there's politics behind it, and Jesus Christ reaches down and wonderfully changes her heart. Do you know what happened? As soon as it happened, she immediately went to the pro-life side. No one had to talk her into it. She knew. Because a change of mind will follow a change of heart. People's thinking will change when they experience a change of heart. Number three, just two more. We, God's people, must have a preserving influence within this corrupt culture. Because Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5.13 that we are the salt of the earth. You say, what does that mean? It means we're different. For salt to be effective, it has to be different. If salt tasted like the French fries you were putting it on, it would have no taste. The reason some of you like to salt your French fries is because it enhances the flavor. But we have to remember that that was even more important in the ancient world before there was refrigeration. Why did people salt their meat in the past? For flavor, to be sure, but it also retarded decay. When meat's going bad, what do you do? You salt it. When the world's going bad, what do you do? You salt it. What should be true of us? We're salt. You know, some of our European neighbors, if you will, marvel that we have such so-called middle-age views on abortion and homosexuality. They marvel that we're so far behind the times. What's the explanation? The explanation is the gospel. There are still enough Christians in our country that are willing to speak out. And we read in other countries about legalized heroin use, about, about open uh, abortion on demand in ways it's not even here yet, and, and just incredible rules on homosexuality. And we say, how can they go so far? It's because of the lack of gospel. We are blessed with so many churches, with so many Christians, who by God's grace speak out. And that's wonderful. Because we should be salt. You say, what does that include? That includes praying. Pray for our country. Pray for our president. That may include volunteering. Some Christians have a great burden and they go to a a crisis pregnancy center to try to help young women who maybe have committed sin not to kill their child, to convince them that that's not the right thing to do. Amen to that. Vote. What a privilege that we can simply live in a country. Sometimes I struggle with who to vote for. I look at two candidates and I don't like either one. But one thing I like to do is I like to say, well, who has the best record on pro-life issues? Because that's at least one issue that I could identify. And yes, if you would be so inclined even to peacefully protest. I looked at a picture this past week in one of the news accounts that I was reading of an abortion clinic, I forget where, somewhere I think in the New England area, of women that have these big signs Uh, abortion escort, uh, and then one that said women's clinic this way, keeping the entrance safe. And there, and I didn't even notice him, but the picture talked about him. There was a man, I couldn't tell anything about him, but it just was a man on his knees praying off to the side by a line that I guess the government has said he was not allowed to cross that line. A man on his knees praying. Now, I don't know if he was from a gospel-preaching church or not. I realize it's possible. Maybe he was Catholic. Maybe he was Orthodox Jew. I don't know. But I thought, what a testimony. Here are these people helping children to be murdered. Here was one man, hopefully, praying that God would intervene and show mercy to these people. The church should have a preserving influence on a corrupt culture. And finally, number four, and maybe my greatest concern after a message like this. The church should compassionately minister the message of God's forgiveness to those who have committed this terrible sin. Guys, we live in a very tight biblical culture, if you will. And we are very 
we are very quick to proclaim that sexual activity outside of marriage is sin, and we should. That murder is always wrong, and we should. And there is a great deal of pressure on people who have gone out and committed sin to do whatever it takes to hide their sin. And thus, in cultures, including our very conservative fundamentalist culture, we have pressure on young people who have sinned to hide their sin because they don't want to face people at church. They don't want to come in single, a teen, and pregnant. And you know what? In one sense, perhaps, the shame of the sin is good, but in another sense, I think God forgive us. Because there should be no place safer for a young girl who's pregnant to walk in than into Trinity Bible Church, where we would graciously and compassionately share with her that the same God who has forgiven me of wicked sin would forgive you of your wicked sin. And if you have come to Christ in forgiveness, then then if Christ no longer judges you and has paid your penalty, who am I to judge you? And if you have not yet come to Christ for forgiveness, then why can't I take a copy of Scripture and let's go and talk privately as I would show you how much God loves you? Because the blood of Christ is so incredibly efficacious that it is able to cleanse a sinner from any sin, including the sin of abortion. I am not naive enough to think that in a crowd this size we don't have at least one woman and maybe more that have had abortions. And as you sat and listened to this message, let me remind you, as wicked as that sin was, even in your own life, That is the very reason that Jesus Christ shed His blood on Calvary. He suffered in your place. And you will never have to face the wrath of Almighty God. Even if you were responsible for the murder of your own child, you will never have to face the wrath of God if you simply come to Christ. That is the Christian message. If you're here tonight and you've had an abortion and you're struggling, please, I I invite you, come speak to me, Pastor Custer, my wife, his wife, someone that you're comfortable with, so that we can make sure that you understand how wonderful the blood of Jesus Christ is. A blood that will wash you clean from your sin. There should be no more loving and forgiving place for a person to come than to Trinity Bible Church as we would share with people the wonderful news that there is no sin that the blood of Christ cannot atone for. That is the spirit, people, of this message. Is abortion a morally repulsive sin? Yes. Is it an insult to our mighty God? Yes. But praise God that God is a forgiving God. And if you've been involved in this type of sin, God will forgive even you if you would come to Him in the name of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, how we thank You, how we thank You that You are not like us. Father, we find it so hard to forgive. We are so quick to hold grudges. And You are not. We rejoice, Father, that You are quick to forgive. And as we come to You in our sin and seek forgiveness in the person of Jesus Christ, we know that we find it. That if we confess our sin, that You're faithful, that You're just, You're righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from iniquity. That though our sins are as scarlet, 
you truly wash them and we become like wool. No longer like crimson, but whiter than snow. Father, we thank you that you're that wonderful of a God. Lord, if there would be one here this evening, more than one, that needs to hear that message, Father, I pray that you would communicate it to his or her heart, the wonderful forgiveness that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would help us as a church to always be a loving community that is quick to minister your forgiveness to others, to share the message of Christ with others. And yet, Lord, at the same time, a church that is quick to take a stand, a church that is quick to be salt, to speak out against the corrupt direction that this world continues to head in. A church that is not ashamed, Lord, to follow You, to obey Your Word, and to proclaim what it clearly teaches. Father, we specifically pray this evening for our nation. We pray for President Bush. We pray for our senators. We pray for our congressmen. We pray for our leaders. Father, perhaps some of these men would even be true Christians. We pray, Father, that through the power of Your Spirit that You would enable them, that You would help them to do what is possible to combat this wicked sin. Father, we pray even for those who don't know You and yet still find this practice morally repulsive, that You would use even them, Father, to at least slow the decay in this land. Father, we pray that You would help us to take seriously the call of being salt, to take seriously the admonition to glorify Your name. We pray that You would help us to seek to bring You glory in all that we do. We thank You, Lord, that You love us. And we pray that You'd help us to love You. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.